watching the Pentagon Channel. From Soldiers Radio and Television in Washington, D.C., this is Army News Watch. Welcome to this special edition of Army News Watch, an interview with the Chief. I'm Sergeant Jose Velasquez. And I'm Sergeant J.R. Williams. On August 1st, General Peter Schoomaker was sworn in as the 35th Army Chief of Staff. Since then, he's traveled the world to visit soldiers and get up to speed with his new job. I had a chance to sit down with the Chief and talk about the shape of today's Army, his 16 areas of focus to develop the force, as well as his return to active duty. Thank you for being here with us today, sir. You left a relatively secure and comfortable environment to return to active duty. Why did you do that, sir? Well, you know, I come from an Army family. My father was in the Army for 32 years and uh, uh, was in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Uh, of course, I've, uh, I did more than a 30-year career. I have a brother that uh, has also been in the Army for about a quarter of a century, and I now have a 19-year-old daughter who is in her second year of our, uh, Army ROTC oh and uh, <laughs> just graduated from jump school uh, this past August. So I, uh, I kind of have Army in my blood. Uh, when I was asked to come back, uh, there was really no way to say no. And quite frankly, you know, we're a nation at war, an Army at war. And when I look at what, uh, what our soldiers uh, and civilians, of course our sailors, airmen, Marine, and Coast Guardsmen are involved in, uh, there's really no way to say no. Somebody. Well, sir, since you've returned, I know you've had an opportunity to speak to soldiers all over the world. Mm -hmm. What's impressed you by today's soldiers? You know, today's soldiers are as good or better than we've ever had in terms of uh, not only their level of training and, uh, you know, their dedication, uh, their professionalism, their dedication to what they're doing. Uh, yeah, and that's precisely what I've seen everywhere I've gone. I mean, they really, uh, they really reinforce every day to me uh, the... Uh, the wisdom in returning, uh, quite frankly. I mean, it's uh, whether they're soldiers I meet in the hospital have been wounded in combat or whether the ones that are engaged uh, supporting combat or, or in, in my wide travels that I've had since the 1st of uh, August, I've never been disappointed uh, by the soldiers that I've met. What about the, uh, the leaders that you've seen out there? Today, young leaders are getting opportunities to learn and to grow, sometimes literally on, on the other end of a, of a weapon. What types of lessons are they learning out there? Well, I think the, uh, you know, war has a way of focusing things. And uh, one of the things that you find in, uh, in units that are engaged and focused by war is the, uh, uh, is the goodness that arises out of uh, not only the junior leaders but the soldiers and, of course, the senior leadership. And, uh, they quickly understand that, you know, this is not about what to think, but how to think, how to solve problems, how to be creative, how to be innovative. My measuring stick, though, isn't whether we're the best army in the world, but are we the best army we could be and should be? And that's, quite frankly, what's focusing on us right now. And I guess part of that would be uh, what you've talked to a lot is the warrior ethos. Why is that so important for soldiers? Well, uh, I think you have to go back up to the full context. You know, armies exist for a reason. That's to defend the nation. And to defend the nation, we've got to be prepared to fight and to win on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. And essential to that is the soldier and the fact that the soldier must be a warrior first. Uh, and being a warrior first means that uh, every soldier must be able to protect themselves, must be able to live in the field, must understand, you know, the fundamental function of the Army. And, uh, and, and that's what I see. So the, this warrior ethos is very important. I mean, you know, it's simple four lines, uh, you know, that we've, we've said over and over. And, you know, the first is that the mission is first. I mean, the mission is paramount. Uh, secondly, that, that as a warrior, you'll never quit, uh, no matter how tough it gets, and that we'll never accept defeat, and that we'll never leave a fellow American behind. I mean, that's the essence of the warrior ethos. Uh, it, it, is in, uh, it incorporates the values of the Army and the values of the nation as it applies to a warrior. And at the strategic level, how, how does the warrior ethos affect the Army as a whole? Well, I think it helps us focus at the strategic level in the fact that the Army, the Army is people, you know, that the soldier is the centerpiece of the Army and that the soldier is the warrior. And what we have to do is we look at how we, uh, 
do all of the things we do from the strategic level. We have to keep our, keep our eye on the fact that that is who we are serving as senior leader. So you've talked a lot about quality and quality in soldiers rather mm -hmm. than quantity. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that and explain what that means? The investment in quality from the, the person through the equipment, through the, the quality of the organization that they're in, uh, is really the paramount endeavor that we have. And uh, you cannot overcome that qualitative edge uh, with pure quantity on things, whether that be equipment or numbers of people or whatever. What are the essential qualities of soldiers today, and, and where would you like those qualities to transform in the future if they require transformation? You know, the essence of, of leadership, uh, you know, whether it be at the strategic, operational, tactical level, is self-awareness and adaptability. Mm -hmm. And I think that what we have in the force today are, uh, are a great uh, number of people uh, at all levels that, that have these qualities, you know. The fact that they can apply their judgment uh, to, to situations that they understand how to think and can adapt and anticipate the kind of challenges that we face. And part of part of the transformation effort is a transformation from from sp specialization, pure specialization. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, really to to a more adaptive, uh, broader range uh, capability in the terms of people. And I, I use the uh, the analogy of uh, it's like the difference in a sprinter, in a quarter miler, in a miler, in a discus throw, and a javelin thrower on track team, mm -hmm. where uh, what we're really looking for is not. Uh, individuals that only specialize in one area, but we're really looking for pentathletes and decathletes, yeah. uh, not only in our soldiers, but in our leadership. People that are capable of doing a wide range of things to a very high degree, uh, with a great deal of skill and with a lot of smarts. And, uh, and that's the kind of army that I think that we are and the, the kind of army we need to continue to improve upon and become uh, as we go. Sir, after 9-11, I know that a lot of things changed. In this era of asymmetric warfare, how do we remain relevant and ready for tomorrow's challenges and today's challenges, really? It's all about anticipation. Mm. It's not about preparing for yesterday's challenges, but it's informing ourselves on yesterday's challenges and projecting them into the future in terms of what it is as we face adaptive foes and the kinds of challenges that we can anticipate uh, there and so relevance has got to do with uh, uh, not only soldiers but the whole organization uh, being relevant to what the nation's needs are going to be not only today but tomorrow as we go and, and of course uh, readiness is is our ability to transition uh, very rapidly uh, because we're becoming a much more expeditionary force we've got to be able to go tonight with what we have this afternoon uh, in the combat and so as you, as you take a look at that balance of relevance and readiness, it really shows that, you know, you have to have, you know, the kind of uh, multi-purpose uh, decathlete kind of force to be able to, uh, to meet all of those challenges. So to be relevant and ready, you have to be willing to change. And that requires, in some respects, I'd imagine, a culture change for an army that, in some respects, has done some things the same way for a while. How, from the top leadership on down, do you affect that change in culture? Well, the fundamental role of leadership is to lead change. You don't manage change, you lead it. And, and what we have to do, you know, to get people to change day-to-day uh, -day things is sometimes just as difficult as leading somebody to get up out of the bottom of a hole and face fire. It takes leadership. Uh, management's got to do with complexity, managing the kinds of supportive functions, the complexity that's involved in resourcing and, and, uh, and managing the kinds of things that have to happen to support change. But fundamentally, change is about leadership. And, and so I think that's uh, my job. That's the job of, the, of not only the senior ar Army leadership, but leaders all the way down through the ranks. Uh, so the Army's a, a very large organization. It's mm -hmm. dynamic, and it's mm -hmm. constantly flowing and moving. It, 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 it exists and works around the world. How do we change from a campaign Army, the, com the Army of the past, to, to one, as you were saying, with those joint expeditionary missions and forces? Well, we don't want to change uh, and give up the fact that we have to have campaign qualities. I mean, we're going to be an army that can continue to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best of them. But what we have to do is develop uh, a lens of, of joint and expeditionary so that we can transition faster, uh, you know, into combat. And part of it is, 
it's not about making everything lighter, but it's about bringing more capability in lighter packages, uh, you know, structures uh, to the fight, which means that we're going to have to leverage more of our joint service capability earlier in the fight as we build the campaign uh, construct as we go. And I think you saw part of that in uh, Iraqi Freedom, mm. where we started the fight uh, with a force that was much smaller than the one that eventually finished the fight. And mm -hmm. we did that by leveraging joint service capabilities in, the, in our interoperability and interdependence of it. And those, those forces that work together, do you see that we are where we need to be with joint forces? And if not, how do we affect change in the Army to meet those needs? Well, we're a long way from where we need to be. I think we have a good start. Mm -hmm. But uh, what we're doing as a joint chiefs is working the joint construct, the joint uh, operational concepts that are required to be the shaping functions for how each of the services fit within a joint operational concept. And so the Army, uh, which is a really important centerpiece of the joint force, the only force that really has the complexity in contact with the ground uh, you know, the frictions that's involved with, uh, with how dynamic and complex our, our, our actual organization is, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, perhaps we have the biggest challenge of all to figure out how to pull uh, our sister service capabilities into our constructs and, and use uh, the joint lands and the expeditionary lands as a way to help us uh, uh, move into the future. But we don't want to give up our campaign qualities in the process. Uh, you know, we, what we're really asking to do is how can we start to fight earlier, how can we can start at a greater distances from home, and how can we conclude it uh, early, you know, without having to commit, uh, you know, uh, our entire force to do it. As you deal with the other services chiefs and the other services overall, do you foresee that they're very willing to, to participate in this no, change? I think we've got one of the best uh, a uh, group of joint chiefs that uh, I, I've seen in, in, in my experience. And uh, I think we all see the same uh, challenge ahead, and we're all committed to solutions to this challenge. Of course, we all bring our service competencies into, into the uh, dynamic. But yesterday, for instance, at the Fletcher Conference, uh, uh, all four of us, or actually to include the Coast Guard, five of us sat on a panel together, and it was amazing. In, uh, the way in which we saw uh, our roles being very, very uh, complementary. Uh, I, w I was really very pleased. Uh, it demonstrated publicly, uh, you know, the kind of uh, teamwork that, uh, that we're seeing at the very top. Now, to affect some of those changes into the future and, and what we're doing today, technology is one of the cornerstones of those changes. It's changed a great deal in the last couple of years. How has it changed the way we conduct the business of soldiering? Well, technology is effective every aspect of what we do. Everything from the ubiquity of information uh, and the, con you know, the constancy of it, uh, the amount of it uh, is huge. Uh, you know, just in that one dimension, the precision that we now have that goes to geolocation and, and uh, uh, you know, our ability to know where we are, to know where the enemy is, to, to bring fires to bear, to maneuver, uh, to operate with a different kind of situational awareness, and then do it in a manner uh, that incorporates a great deal of speed and agility, both at the strategic level and at the operational tactical levels. Uh, you know, the, the it, technology has enabled us to touch almost every dimension, uh, you know, of our, of, our, uh, of our domain, really. Sir, I know that uh, your background was in, some sp in special operations, and in special operations really treasures the human factor. We're talking about technology. What areas do you feel, maybe the human factor being one of them, that shouldn't be changed by technology and maybe should, should focus more on the warrior ethos? Well, you know, I think the human, again, I'll go back to the fact that the human dimension is, is what we're trying to enable. You know, we're trying to enhance the human dimension with our technologies. That, that the reason the human is important is because the human is what embodies the values. And so the Army's values and the nation's values are embedded in the soldiers that we field. And what we want to do is, is keep those values as, as uh, uh, paramount uh, in, in what we do, but enable uh, these humans to uh, 
uh, not only use their judgment, but their uh, those intangible human qualities that, that exist on the battlefield to include courage uh, in, in ways that uh, uh, will help us accomplish the mission and at the same time save lives. Still to come on this special edition of Army News Watch, the Chief of Staff talks more on his focus areas as the way ahead. And how force stabilization will benefit the Army as well as the soldier. Stay with us. I'm Tony Schumacher, driver of the U.S. Army Top Fuel Dragster, and from everyone at the U.S. Army Racing Team, we'd like to wish all our soldiers and family members around the world happy holidays. Hoo I'm Joe Nemechek, driver of the U.S. Army Pontiac, and I want to wish all the soldiers overseas happy holidays. Hi, this is Todd Bodine, driver of the National Guard Ford. Wishing all the troops a safe and happy holiday, and we really appreciate what you do for your country. Thank you. to this special edition of Army News Watch. Chief of Staff General Peter Schoomaker is all about building a relevant and ready Army. To emphasize that, he made it the Army's theme. That's right, JR. As we return to the second half of my interview with the Chief, he talks more on his 16 assessment areas, including how force stabilization will benefit soldiers and the Army. Do you feel that you've been able to identify the specific areas that we can change to be better? Well, uh, first of all, in my travels, I've not only met with lots of soldiers, sailor, airmen, and Marines, but uh, I also have met with 71 of my counterparts, other chiefs of staffs of armies, uh, 71 of them since the 1st of August. And this is a very important dimension of what our Army uh, brings to the table, mm -hmm. the fact that our Army, Army to Army connections on a strategic scale are are hugely important to uh, to our national security policy and to to the world that, that we see. Meeting soldiers and being in the field and virtually everywhere that uh, that we have any major concentrations of soldiers and in many places where we have very small concentrations, I've never been disappointed in what I've seen. But while I was doing that, what I asked uh, our transition team to do was to pulse the army and to find out where we could immediately affect the kind of things that would cause and set the conditions for really fundamental cultural change in the Army in the direction that we wanted to transform. And that's where these 16 areas came from. Uh, they are really a, uh, uh, an aggregation of the kinds of things that the transition team and all of those that they talked to thought uh, in conjunction with what I thought um, were where we could uh, set the conditions for the kind of transformation that we need to make because transformation is more than just the equipment. It, it has to do with the doctrine, the organization, the training, the leader development, all of the kinds of things that, uh, uh, that we do across the, uh, the force. And so that, that's really what the 16 focus areas are, are start points and points that we can touch the system and cause uh, change that as we aggregate those changes will fundamentally change the culture of the Army. Does the Army leadership favor increasing troop size or troop strength to alleviate some of the current stress on the forces? Well, you know, this is a really difficult question. It's one that has far-reaching uh, uh, implications. And what we know right now is that, you know, we have an Army of over a million people in the Active Guard and Reserve. 
And we know there's a lot we have to do internally to be able to use the end strength and the, and the force structure that we already have. Uh, you know, adding people is, is hugely expensive. And <clears throat> what we don't want to do is add people to a force that might not be organized uh, as well as it should be. Mm -hmm. Because if you add a lot of people to the Army and we end up having to pay, because our top line is going to be relatively fixed, and we're going to have to pay more of our top line to more people, that as we move into the future, and is, let's say that I, uh, our current effort is a spike, mm -hmm. that this is an unusual level of activity. Mm -hmm. And it takes us two years to add, you know, a division or two to the Army. And we end up getting past the spike and have a, a large force structure that mm -hmm. we're now going to have to pay for without the kind of top line assistance that we're getting out through supplemental funding. Mm -hmm. We end up now not having ammunition, not having fuel, not having the money to modernize and do the kinds of things we need to do. And that was the kind of army that I entered uh, when I first came in the army. I mean, well, we didn't have enough fuel to move 50 miles a month. Well, we didn't have money to PCS people. I mean, I was extended in Korea as a captain for three or four months because they didn't have PCS money. And we only had enough fuel to go 50 miles a month mm -hmm. on the thing. We had to make choices between doing tank gunnery and heating our barracks. And th these are the kinds of pressures that you end up with going back to what we call the hollow army. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we had the structure, but we didn't have the, the money to operate that structure and maintain the readiness that we wanted. So this is the kind of strategic uh, context that we have to think about. Mm -hmm. We have over a million people in the Army today, and there's a lot of that structure that isn't as available to us as it needs to be. Um, in, in your assessment, sir, how then do we look at the force and balance it out to where the active, the reserve, and the National Guard are helping each other in more productive ways? Well, we have a construct that you may have seen looks like a pyramid. And what it recognizes at the top of the pyramid is that we have to have forces available on a moment's notice, both reserve component forces to do homeland security, homeland defense, and active forces to do expeditionary warfare. And then lower on that pyramid, we have to have an active and reserve component construct that reinforces those those areas at the tip of the pyramid. And below that, we have to have depth that gives us the combat support, combat service support structure we need to not only campaign, but also to be expeditionary and also do the homeland security function. And below all of that is the institutional army, the trade-up army, the, 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 uh, the, the secretariat and the, uh, the department of the army, and all of the kind of things that, that run the school systems and that equip the force and do those things. So that's the total force. And what we're trying to do you set that force up so that it is, it is uh, we get more synergy out of what we have and more availability of those, of those pieces. And so what our real thinking is, is that we ought to see uh, the only difference between the active and reserve components ought to be availability. And we're, we're trying to put an awful lot of emphasis on increasing the, the uh, quality of equipment, quality of training across the whole force to include the reserve components and to make more of that available to us. Sir, I know that the Navy employs an aspect of force stabilization that allows them to stay together for a longer period of time. How will force stabilization benefit both the Army as well as the individual soldier? Well, the Navy, um, the Navy is also transforming, and it's moving more in a direction. It's coming back in a direction uh, that we're coming from. We're, we're, we're meeting, really, kind of mm -hmm. in the middle. The Navy's been a cyclical force, one that works up, deploys, comes back and, and stands down kind of a thing. And, and it's, it's, it's centered around uh, platforms and, and uh, uh, you know, carrier battle groups, let's say, and, and the way they do that. We are looking at how we can modulize the Army, stabilize the force, and, and hold, uh, uh, deploy uh, ready entities as units, stabilized leadership, stabilized train together, deploy together, return together kind of a construct. So we're both kind of moving, uh, you know, to a middle point on that thing. But what, what I see in that is if we're successful in force stabilization, that we will be able to leave people in home stations uh, longer periods of time. Instead of moving people every two or three years, we might move them every five, six, or seven years if they can professionally develop at the same location. And this gives families an opportunity for spouses to work, for families to invest in homes if they want to, for kids to stay in school, uh, in schools they like, uh, you know, without the, as much disruption. Mm -hmm. And we feel that, that by rotating units to and from home stations, uh, let's say on six-month rotation, 
uh, that not only will we have better units for the war fight because we have stability in the units, but we also have stable families. Now, as as uh, as the Army looks at something like that, obviously, once again, we go back to the change in culture and how we do things. Do you foresee, from your perspective, a willingness and a desire to, to go to that type of force stabilization? Uh, all indications are there's th that, uh, uh, that there is uh, that this resonates well with the force. Now we've got a long way to go before we before we have this uh, totally locked down the way we want. As you know, we're working right now with Third Infantry Division as we reset it uh, as the beginning of this process. This will take us a while to do, uh, but what we're trying to do is slow down the movement within the Army and to organize starting with Third Infantry Division in a way that will give us this modularity and stability. And then as we reset forces coming back out of Iraqi freedom, we'll do more and more units as we go. And then as we move on down several years down the road and we relook this whole global uh, reposturing issue, mm -hmm. I, I can see where we'll have a majority of the Army in CONUS rotating to, to deployments and then back to home stations here in CONUS with, with less of a forward footprint. There's, there's so much to talk about, sir, so many questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, I know that your time is, is short. Um, I did want, though, before you go, the opportunity to ask you if there are any messages, any thoughts that you might have for the soldiers that are deployed today all over the world? Well, I think, uh, first of all, our Army, all soldiers in our Army, Active Guard and Reserve, whether they're deployed right now into the war or supporting the war effort or getting ready to go, need to understand how proud all of us are of every soldier and their families and the civilians in the Army. I mean, we are absolutely proud. The American people are proud of them. I mean, if you take a look at, at the, uh, the opinion of what people feel about their army right now. I mean, we, we are enjoying uh, an extraordinary amount of support. And, and I think that's well deserved. I think it's well earned. And I think soldiers need to know that, you know, that, that this is not called service for nothing. I mean, this is all about giving more than you get. But one of the things that I think that we're earning every day is the respect of the American people and in that, their support, which is critical, uh, you know, to the world that we're going into. Sir, I hope that uh, we have the opportunity to, to continue this conversation at another sure. time. Look forward to it. Thank you very much for being on Welcome. Army News Watch. <laughs> JR, after talking to the Chief, the one thing I took away from the interview is how focused he is on taking care of soldiers. It's not just about equipment and technology to him, but bringing stability and balance to the force and making sure that every soldier has what he or she needs to remain relevant and ready. Well, thanks, Jose. And that wraps up this edition of Army News Watch. This week, we salute SCCTV in Clinton County, South Carolina. And HCTV Channel 23 in Fairfax County, Virginia. From all of us at Soldiers Radio and Television, happy holidays. For the latest military news and information, log on at army.mil and soldiersradio.com. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you next time for the stories that make America's Army.